inspirational uh, group of speakers today. Um, so I'm going to, going to speak to you about something a little bit different. We're going to talk about robotics and the role that it's playing in shaking up some of the most entrenched consumer industries. And I'll share a bit about what we at Anki are doing to play our part through the entertainment space. Now, robotics has a pretty long history, but um, going back to uh, you know, our time in graduate school and, uh, and even before, it was almost exclusively focused on uh, government applications, defense, space, pure research, um, maybe industrial applications, agriculture. Um, we started Anki to use these technologies to make uh, consumer products and try to reinvent the, tr the types of experiences that, uh, that could be possible and create products that weren't, um, uh, people wouldn't have thought of uh, uh, being able to exist. And so I'll start with a, uh, with a slide that may be one of the more dry ones you'll see today, but it does a really great job of capturing why the last few years have really been an inflection point in some of the most important needs for robotics innovation. So this shows uh, the annual production of mobile phones and then more recently smartphones and tablets. And if you look at the legend on the left, this is pretty staggering. We're talking about billions of, uh, of mobile devices that have been produced um, over the, uh, every single year over the last few years. And what this does to the price, capability, and quality of the components uh, that are available is pretty incredible. We're talking about microcontrollers, memories, sensors, batteries, um, uh, motors all of the things that you need for robotics uh, consumer products. But all of a sudden, uh, you can unlock price points and capabilities that were completely out of reach before. And with smartphones, you go one step further, you have an interface and a brain behind any real-world ecosystem. And so this sets the stage for a pretty incredible level of innovation that's possible in a very, very short amount of time. So I'll start with an example that uh, all of us are increasingly familiar with, um, and that is transportation, and more specifically, self-driving cars. So a little bit of history here. Um, research goes back many decades in self-driving cars, but most of us would agree uh, in, the, in the field that one of the big sparks that happened was in 2004. DARPA created a challenge uh, that was to drive autonomously through a desert uh, course, about 150 miles. They had a $2 million prize for it, and the first team that could complete that race in the fastest uh, time would end up winning the prize. And so there were dozens of entrants, including uh, uh, you know, this team from Carnegie Mellon that ended up getting the furthest. Uh, our department got about seven and a half miles before we hit a rock and flipped over and busted all those expensive sensors on the top. Um, so there was a, a you know, bit of disappointment there, but at the same time, we were pretty excited because this was a huge step forward in terms of the capabilities that were available to that point. Nobody would have predicted back in 2004 that just over 10 years later, we would have autonomous cars that in many environments are actually provably safer than a human. And so DARPA repeated this challenge next year, and this time, just one year later, there were four different teams that finished this course, uh, and Stanford ended up uh, having the winning entry. And so this is 150 miles, uh, no obstacles at that point, but it was completely unstructured, kind of open terrain through the desert. And just two years later, they followed this up with the uh, urban equivalent, where now teams have to navigate through a suburban environment. There were traffic lights, stop signs, moving, uh, other moving cars, they had to park. And, uh, and again, multiple teams ended up completing this uh, course. And this very, very clearly set the stage for what Google took over in 2011 with their self-driving car project. And so most people in the space would consider Google the front runner. Part of it is that they have an incredible team and they also have a pretty long lead in terms of, uh, in terms of time. And, uh, and so they basically took the best uh, of, of a lot of these teams, Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, MIT, and a few other sources. And they've been gradually growing this team. And now by uh, middle of this year, they've had almost 2 million uh, autonomous miles driven on open roads and only 14 minor accidents and 13 of them were proven to be the fault of the other guy. So not a bad track record. Um, typically you'd see an accident uh, by human every 50 to 100,000 miles. So very, very nice statistics. And all of us are familiar with Tesla who uh, somewhat controversially has already opened up full autonomous driving on certain roads and now there have been hundreds of thousands of miles driven autonomously by consumer accessible uh, commercial vehicles. Pretty incredible. And so now it has a sense of inevitability where it's clear that we're going to have fully autonomous cars and it's just a question of when and under what circumstances. And now there's well over 40 uh, companies that are working on their own versions of autonomous cars or autonomous technology. But the interesting thing is that the front runners uh, in this space that most people would consider uh, in the lead 
are not the companies you would expect. They're not automotive companies from Detroit, they're not from Germany, they're not, uh, they're not from Japan. They're Silicon Valley software companies. And I would actually put Tesla in this category as well because even though they manufacture cars, they understand better than any other automotive manufacturer that the value of a car is increasingly becoming software and not the hardware and design that goes into it. And so you see this sort of pattern of, uh, of, of disruption where the incumbents in the space aren't necessarily the ones that are in a position to revolutionize themself, uh, themselves. And what's interesting is that robotics, most generally, you can think of as just the extension of software into the physical world. If you can have something physical that understands its environment, can interact with it, you can do something really powerful, and that's to just use software to control it and optimize it and give it a level of function, uh, capability, personality, and do things that you would never, ever expect. And that's going to hit this in this type of way a number of industries. For us, we decided to start with entertainment, and more specifically, we focused on the toy industry. Uh, this is one of the industries that's been the most stagnant and least technology-driven industries out there, and so they've had almost a, um, a race to the bottom in terms of price, and in many cases, quality as well. We wanted to flip it upside down, and we started thinking about what would it take to actually bring a level of interaction and gameplay to physical characters and toys that was previously impossible. So we literally wanted to program video games on top of physical characters in the real world and bring that type of an experience to life. Um, so we started many years ago. Our first product was a battle racing game called Drive. Uh, we just released last fall a successor to it that's Overdrive. Uh, and this is a game where you control robotic cars with mobile devices, but it brings to life all these augmented elements of weapons and special abilities. I'm going to show you a quick clip. Uh, this is something that we're, is still a work in progress, um, but uh, it's coming along pretty well, so I thought it would be fun to share with you guys a look at what Overdrive is. Donkey Overdrive. What does driving the future look like? It looks like a state-of-the-art optical sensor scanning invisible code 500 times each second. It looks like artificial intelligence armed to the teeth with advanced weaponry designed specifically to eliminate you. And it looks like your rad dad with his iPad taking you down once again. Onki Overdrive, drive the future. <laughs> so, thank you. So we all want to be that rad dad. And what's fun is that 40% of our players are actually adults. It's something you would never really see from a traditional toy company. So that's been a lot of fun to see. And so this was um, released last fall, one of the top selling toys in the US and Germany, and we're continuing to, uh, to evolve it. Um, but going back to 2011, we started thinking about uh, how could we take this to the next level. And what we wanted to do was to bring a physical character to life with a level of personality and emotional depth and behavioral intelligence that you would never see outside of a screen. And so imagine uh, your favorite characters from Pixar, or DreamWorks, these beautiful characters that have all this richness and emotional depth, uh, the behavior, the th thinking behind every single emotion that they express. We asked the question, what would it take to bring a character like this to life? And not just give it an emotional richness that's beyond anything that's possible, but to actually go deeper than that and have all of those emotions be contextually aware because we're using robotics and AI to understand the environment, play games, recognize people, and actually change the character's emotions and capabilities over time as you continue playing with it. And that's something that's a really hard problem in the overlap of a lot of dis uh, different uh, disciplines. And so our first character of this type is a little robot uh, named Cosmo, who's going to be coming out this fall in October. I'll play a little teaser um, that shows a little touch of his personality. Once in a lifetime, an innovation comes along that changes the course of mankind. A modern marvel of science and engineering. Allow me to introduce... Cosmo! Cosmo? Cosmo! Oh boy. Yes, Cosmo. You can play later. <laughs> so a little bit tongue chic but this is a little robot, but he's got a huge personality. He's quirky, he's a little mischievous, curious. And he starts out as a newbie who wants to be this Jedi Master superhero robot, but has to get some help to get there. And so you play with him, and you actually help him unlock his capabilities, his personality, play games, and evolve over time. But what's most interesting is what goes into actually making him. And so I'll show you a small clip of uh, you know, one, one element of him just kind of exploring an environment around him. And so our goal is to make him feel like he's alive, even when he's asleep on his little throne or waking up for the first time and seeing the world around him. 
the, the breakthrough for us was in approaching Cosmo not as a toy or as a video game character, but as a character from an animated film. And so we literally built an animation studio within a robotics company with folks with backgrounds from Pixar and DreamWorks, really thinking about how do we bring a character like this to life and make him responsive and immersive and as emotionally rich as possible in everything that he might do. But these animators have to work with game designers, roboticists, people from AI to really make this character feel like he's interactive. And at the end of the day, the compass is, does he feel like he's alive? And so here's a, here's a look at exactly what you just saw, but rendered. And so this is Cosmo waking up and seeing the world around him. And what's interesting is that what you saw physically and what you see digitally was made using the exact same source. This is a program called Maya, which is the most common program used to animate digital characters. But we use it in a very different way. We actually use, instead of rendering Cosmo digitally, we spliced it to where we have our animators actually animating a physical Cosmo. And that is what makes him come to life. And that's completely different than anything that's, uh, that anybody's ever tried to do because we're taking an approach that truly is an approach from film. And what's interesting is that when you have this level of control over a character like this, you can do pretty incredible things. You can start storyboarding, you can think about Cosmo's background, what motivates him, uh, what drives him, what scares him, what are his insecurities, what are his goals in life, and how do you bring all of that together in a story that is both rich and interactive. And that's something that is, uh, it's a really, really powerful new dimension. And so for us, Cosmo is the first of what we hope is a long line of characters with evolving uh, personalities, interactions, and bigger and bigger capabilities. And in, at Anki, we're almost thinking about this as a new type of, uh, of studio for interactive, real-world, uh, physical characters and stories. And so with, for you guys, I'm going to leave you with one thought. Many of you are in the world of content and media. Begin to think of the physical world as just another dimension within which characters and stories can exist. And obviously this brings with it a lot of uh, extra complexities and challenges you may not have digitally, but if you can embrace those, you can hit a far higher level of, uh, of impact and emotional connection than you ever could before. And you can imagine what you can do when you bring the sort of stories and worlds that we're used to to life and out of a screen. Thank you very much.